Let me minimize this. Uh, so, first of all, I uh, uh, thank the organizers uh, for putting together this really nice uh, conference. And we um, went uh, uh, the foreground here. Uh, and so, uh, in the last session, uh, I want to present you uh, um, for, uh, the foreground package manager and how we want to use it. Uh, to go towards a rich ecosystem of Fortran packages. And um, uh, a few words about myself. Uh, I'm Sebastian, I'm, uh, I'm a PhD student in computational chemistry at the University of Bonn. And <clears throat> I've been starting in working on Fortran package manager uh, as, a, um, side, uh, as a hobby project um, uh, for more than a year now. So, of course, uh, I didn't do all the work uh, on myself here, uh, but we, uh, we have um, a lot of people who contributed, uh, like Andre and Mila, and putting together the initial prototype, uh, Brett uh, uh, starting the uh, Haskell implementation was the first work, uh, um, Lawrence and John. Uh, um, we put a lot of effort to uh, to get the current version of FPM running. Um, uh, Jakub, uh, who contributed uh, in, uh, in the Google Summer of Code, and uh, Vincent and Mari, uh, who, who came up with a lot of feedback and uh, ideas uh, um, <clears throat> in the discussion and an issue tracker, and for the uh, for getting a lot of people here who've contributed. So. Um, I'm oh, sorry about that. Um, so, how um, this talk is going to be structured? Uh, we need to start um, with a quick motivation why we need Fortran Package Manager, how we implemented FPM in Fortran, and then a feature overview, which is possible right now with FPM, and then end with a bit of a summary in the Outlook uh, where we want to go. Uh, for the sheet. So, what's our motivation to build a package management system for Fortran? So, as you already heard uh, in Erlon's talk, building and distributing Fortran software is simply difficult. And yeah, just a couple of points which probably some of you have encountered, uh, like having a manual make file uh, and trying to run your system, but it's not quite the same as the author's warning. It just doesn't work, and you have to put some effort into modifying it or finding a way to get it compiled. Or you have something like AutoConf, and you're working on Windows, um, and you don't have a compatibility layer, so getting to working on native Windows might be a bit more difficult. Of course, it's also not state of the art a great reboot for Fortran. Usually, people recommend to use CMAC, but if you're new to, uh, to software uh, uh, development in Fortran, and the learning curve of CMake can be quite steep and it uh, can be difficult to get it right and working for everybody on the first draft. And there are also more user friendly build systems like Mason, but those um, might uh, have some small, uh, uh, smaller issues like not being able to install module files automatically. So, all in all, writing build files and adjusting them for Fortran can be quite time intensive. And Actually, every minute we spend writing our build files and adjusting them is the time we can't spend on actually writing good Fortran software. The other issue is uh, it can be difficult and quite tedious to reuse Fortran source code. And of course, one could say you can system wide install it and then just uh, use it uh, by linking it against the library of compiled, but this can be dangerous if you are working with multiple Fortran compilers because. Uh, by default, there's no AB compatibility between uh, between different uh, between different uh, um, compilers. Of course, you can solve this issue by using an environment manager, but this is uh, again something you have to look into as a user. This is not something that's taken automatically care of. And then eventually, it uh, turns out this is just nearly impossible to depend on the Fortran project without redistributing it at some point, which brings a lot of issues because we have to think about project license if we're allowed to redistribute it. You have to keep it up to date uh, in case there are bug fixes. So 
uh, on all uh, the other things to, uh, which make this difficult. And we thought uh, it would be good to have a Fortran specific build system package manager, which fixes all those issues and uh, which makes it easy to create, re uh, to create reusable Fortran on libraries. And this is uh, where the Fortran package manager comes in. Before I'm uh, going to uh, the details, let's show what we got so far. So this is the adoption of FPM. Um, you can see the timeline here starting before the last Fortran con, uh, 2018, and we are here today at the Fortran con. And <clears throat> so this project, uh, as Lawrence told you, started uh, in the beginning of 2020. And um, he, uh, and as you see, I just marked all the releases. And at this point, um, we got a very steady increase in new FDM projects up to today with 173 uh, open source projects using FBI. And it's not just a few users uh, developed those, uh, over all those projects, there are 160 unique developers who have contributed there. And for FBM itself, we have uh, now 53 contributors, which uh, discussed on the issue board uh, and, and reviewed code. And of those, 19 developers actually contribute code to FBM, which is a quite good quote uh, because it's more than one third uh, or contributes to the project. The project is hosted on GitHub, it's MIT licensed. You can find it at github.com uh, for online FBM. All right, so let's talk about how we implement FBM. So first of all, the question is how uh, which language one you uh, use for implementing the package manager. And of course, one of our criteria is it should be fast and robust overhead. So the most uh, so choice here would be to use a compiled language. And of course, you want to have it self-contained and simple to set up. Having a package manager, which depends on a complex build system, is not easy to set up and uh, making it more difficult to use in the first place. So we want to have something with a small runtime library or a runtime library we can just bundle in maybe in static binary. And of course, which is also a very important aspect for us, we want to have easily accessible for our users to make, give them the possibility to contribute back. And of course, our target group are mostly for from developers. So from the language we considered, uh, there's of course Python because most Fortran developers also know a bit of Python, but there are a lot of issues with this. So what was discussed uh, was we a root out quick, which leaves a couple of compiled languages, um, of course, C++, uh, which many uh, Fortran developers use. Um, there's also Rust, which has uh, um, the cargo package manager, which is the main inspiration for FPM. But of course, technical depth uh, to get into Rust programming is uh, is quite high. We don't have much uh, uh, many Rust programmers in the Fortran community. Um, you all know from the last uh, might all know from the last Fortran con that the initial prototype was written in Haskell, and similar to Rust, uh, um, there are not many Haskell developers in the Fortran community. Um, so one ob uh, obvious choice, of course is to use Fortran because Fortran is the most well-known language in our community. Compilers can easily produce static linear binaries. And also as a bonus, we uh, get the possibility to identify shortcomings in Fortran while implementing FPM. And we can use this for giving feedback to the standard, uh, standard library, uh, what features we might need to implement and look into. So now building uh, the Fortran implementation um, means we need a couple of building blocks. So there's a need for common line an interface builder. There's uh, John's uh, MCLIA2 package which we use. We need a TOML pa uh, parser library, so some input format, we, uh, we choose TOML. There's TOML F package, uh, which we are able to use. We need some open source scanning, uh, not maybe not a complete parser, but just uh, um, even with the advantages. We implemented this in FPM, and we need some architecture for multiprocessing and scheduling, and we have those with OpenMP directives. These are the building blocks we use 
to roughly rebuild our photon prototype. Now, at this point, we already have dependencies. And then the question is, how do we build a photon project with photon dependencies best? And the answer is, we build FPM with FPM itself. And to do so, we have to bootstrap it at some point. We had the Haskell version, could compile it, but at some point, we want to compile FPM, uh, the Photon FPM version with, the, uh, with another Photon FPM. And for this, we use a trick. We just take all the Photon source files, concatenate them in one file, and compile this with a Photon compiler. So we just, we just have to generate this file. You can just download, uh, download it, compile it with your Photon compiler, and get the almost complete FPM by which contains all the, uh, all the functionality provided with uh, pure photon implementations. And then we can use this binary to bootstrap the full FPM binary, which contains some additional C components where we assess the POSIX API uh, for additional, um, additional uh, uh, more performant implementation than our pure photon ones. So with this step, you can basically, with nothing but a photon compiler, uh, bootstrap FPM. And we think it's a reasonable assumption um, that every system where we want to use FPM also has a photon compiler. With this, uh, now we have FPM. Question is, what can we do with this? So our common interface is Orient, and this was a uh, package managed cargo or stack are doing. So of course, FPM can build projects and in the build command, we handle automatically module and submodule interdependencies. And FPM will just check your project for executables, tests, and automatically create a target. So, in principle, uh, everything's taken care of. One of the nice things that you can do with FPM is that you can actually, you don't have to install your project directly, uh, you can just run it from our source. And the run command uh, in FPM allows you to run an executable or an example for the project. You can also select multiples with a wildcard feature available to select uh, multiple executables. In a similar way, FPM detects tests that allows you to run a complete test suite of your projects. And in case it fails, you can just grab uh, the test runner in a debugger uh, and, uh, and, check, uh, and check out the, uh, the potential crash. So for all this, this uh, the good thing if we had the default layout and FPM provides with the new feature, the possibility to just create new projects with the FPM layout. And also if you have an existing project, you, uh, you can just use FPM new to backfill uh, the, feed, uh, the FPM, inf uh, FPM layout afterwards. Finally, of course, FPM allows you to handle dependencies. So we have our update feature, which uh, initialize all dependencies, which is usually run automatically, so you don't have to use it explicitly, but it allows you to have some basic caching and locking of variable uh, of, your, of your dependencies. Um, and finally, FPM is also able to install uh, a project, and we usually install the user prefix and not the system prefix. So we're talking about the FPM project layout, so what does this look like? So in the top level, there's a file we call FPM Tommel, which is our package manifest. And then you have a couple of uh, directories where we place your source. So everything in the source directory it will go into the, uh, into the library, and this is the reusable part of your FPM pro uh, project. Depending on this project, it makes all the modules in this, uh, in this directory available to the dependent uh, projects. You can put everything in app, which, uh, which will uh, be an executable and which will be installable by FPM. If you want to uh, add demonstrations of your API and your library, uh, you can just add some small example programs, which can also be run easily from the FPM uh, command line. And finally, uh, with support test directory, you can uh, put your unit tests uh, to automatically make them run by FPM. And if you follow this layout, the simplest package manifest is nothing but the, na uh, but the name of the project, uh, project, nothing else to care about. Of course, you don't have to follow this default layout. You can customize it by specifying the source to your respective uh, tables. 
And of course, since we are using a package manifest with a configuration language like Tomble, we limit the complexity you, can, you have to expect in the build file. And it mainly contains the metadata of the project, but no actual with extraction. They are well known for Fortran, we implement them so you don't have to worry about this. Finally, uh, executable names are taken from, uh, from program units, which is quite nice, and you can, of course, link system libraries. And one of the main points in FPM, we have first class dependencies, um, which means if you just point a uh, dependency to reference it, uh, to some projects by referring, uh, for example, with a Git URL, FPM will automatically take care of this to include this project, and maybe also all of its dependencies for you. So everything in this dependencies will automatically be uh, uh, included and fetched if another project depends on your library. If you have something you only need for testing, uh, we also provide different scopes, uh, which allow you to, for example, include testing framework just for uh, just locally for your uh, package. And you can even limit some dependencies to a single target. Like if you want to have a command line, uh, um, command line, uh, line interface, then it's probably only a requires uh, for your executable targets we will uh, install. And finally, there's the possibility to extend FPM with plugins. There's some space in the package manifest, which allows third party projects to add metadata. So everything can be in one place. This can be used by formatters, linters, and, and, and stuff like this, but also by plugins. And plugins are just picked automatically up from the command line. And we have two uh, plugins uh, I'm currently aware of. And I'm describing it briefly, but I think it's easier to just show you what they're able to do. I think I have enough time to do this. So, now, <clears throat> that, uh, let's, uh, let's check this out. So this is the latest version of FPM. And if I'm now checking for something like FPM search, this, this is just the unknown command. But um, I've installed packages in advance. So If you now check for FPM search, it's available, and FPM search will automatically pick up this command. Download the, reg the registry. Hopefully, it doesn't take uh, too long now. And show you all the FPM packages that are currently registered uh, in our registry. You can search this. Um, of course, for Let's see. I know I've got uh, a project there. So maybe you want to uh, see a uh, uh, Tomo library here. is available or the JSON. Um, there's a JSON library. I am so um, something um, similar to the FPM man project integrates nicely here. Here and if you, uh, for example, just want to look up the merge command from, FB, uh, from the Fortran standard, you will find a complete man page here. Which then can make browser go and just type in a few less. All right. So if I, uh, if I still have some time, maybe I can just show you compile, uh, compiling with FPM. So let's try talking about the package manager here. So let's see if FPM can compile itself. And then you can see this will even run in, I think, uh, yeah. So compiling FPM with FPM uh, from empty directory just takes like six seconds. Ooh. Let's go back in the presentation. Uh, just a few slides to show you. So, what else? Uh, we're not perfect. That's not perfect yet. It's the alpha version right now. So, we need more support for uh, custom compiler profiles. So, if, uh, this is something uh, Jakob is going to tell you about. We want to support a custom preprocessor, especially for projects like Standard Loop, which use FIP or have their own. 
we have a plugin for the FPM registry where we could uh, be exploring uh, how this is working. And we are looking for a, a, a for a way to integrate the package registry directly with the Falcon FPM. One thing which is probably really important, we have to look into a way to provide optional dependencies to make features conditionally available. And some uh, was requested from time to time, some build script support, if we have some more complex projects, which don't directly build to Fortran and C or C++ compiler. So with this, uh, I want to encourage you, give FPM a try. You can get it now. Um, we spent some time uh, to package it for various ecosystems. Um, you can start install it from, uh, from Conda Forge, uh, just, uh, just for, for Linux and, and Mac OS. If you're on Windows and uh, using the MSYS2, uh, you can pack, uh, install it with Pac-Man. I'm also maintaining a, a home boot tab where you can install FPM if you, if you are Mac-based. And um, it's also now in the spec development version. And if none of those package managers is for you, uh, you can just clone our project and run the install script, which will take care of bootstrapping FPM for the first time on your platform. So um, that would be everything from my side. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sebastian. That was a really great presentation of um, FPM and what we can do with it. So um, I think we'll uh, move on to Jakob's talk now uh, on his GSOC work over the summer on uh, managing compiler flags in FPM. So Jakob, if you go ahead and share your screen. Um, um, I can see your slides. No. Now. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. That's yeah, great. perfect. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, go ahead. Uh, Yeah, so uh, uh, try to hide this somehow. Yeah, so welcome everyone to my uh, presentation about uh, well, my contribution to FPM. I've been working with uh, Lawrence, Brad, and Sebastian over the summer, uh, and I'm, I was trying to implement uh, compiler profiles in FPM. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to uh, tell you more about the motivation behind the project why we implemented it and uh, why uh, it helps. So uh, previously, the, uh, mo the easiest way how to uh, tell the compiler some custom flags that you want to include uh, or to, uh, you wanted to compile with uh, your MP, uh, FPM uh, project were to use the minus minus flag and then a string of uh, flags you actually wanted to compile with but there were also some uh, uh, default flags built into uh, the uh, command line uh, module in FPM but this project enables us to uh, have uh, more uh, complicated and advanced uh, compiler profiles and now I will explain how we can also have them uh, uh, project scope wise, and you can separate them uh, into yeah, the, the scope. So uh, we implemented a parser uh, for Tomo. So uh, all the profiles can be uh, described in fpm.toml file in a profile table. It is a table of tables uh, with three levels of depth. The first level is uh, are the names of the profiles, which uh, can be like debug, release, anything you can imagine. And uh, the level below that, the second level of that, uh, are the compilers. So for example, G4, on I4, and E4, ran, anything that's built into FPM, you can use. And the uh, third level uh, are the compilers. Uh, no, not the compilers, operating systems. So, uh, and you can, uh, the only uh, field that needs to be there is required uh, is the compiler one, but you can uh, omit the name of uh, the 
profile and then the content of that profile is appended like the for example if you uh, remove the debug then the flags from this profile will be appended to every other matching profile for example if you needed to uh, have all the profiles have some standard flag then uh, this will be a good option to just have uh, profiles.g4tan.linux and then all the g4tan.linux profiles will have that standard flag and you can also uh, omit the operating system prof uh, field and then uh, the uh, flags are used when uh, the FPM cannot find any other ma uh, better matching profile. There are four fields in the uh, profile itself. First are flags, which are uh, flags for Fortran. Then there are C flags, which are flags uh, for uh, C uh, source files. Link time flags are uh, added to executables. And then there is file field, which allows you to specify the exact uh, flags for uh, a specified uh, file. So you can just say that uh, read m dot f90 will have these flags and it will ignore all the others, uh, the Fortran flags, and etc. Uh, you have also uh, so you can specify the, uh, the flags in fpm.toml, but there are also still uh, some built-in profiles or the common line built-in uh, default profile, uh, default flags, which were uh, there before, are now built-in profiles and they uh, should allow you to, uh, like they, are, they should cover most use cases, but if a user wants to override them, he just can't specify like there is definitely a, a debug profile for g4 fran on linux and the user if one he wants to uh, specify a profile that will override that it will just specify uh, a profile in fpm.toml and it will be overwritten and uh uh just explain how the hierarchy works so if uh, a user specifies a profile then it has a priority before a built-in profile but if this is uh, in a dependency, and uh, as uh, Sebastian already explained, like uh, the FPM just uh, gets dependencies for you. So if you have a main package and it has a dependency and the dependency doesn't uh, specify a profile, but the parent does, then the built-in profiles are still ignored and uh, the dependency just asks the parent for the profile. And now I will show you some examples. So this is uh, an example fpm.toml file. We have three profiles, as you can see. The first one doesn't uh, have the uh, name of uh, the profile, so it will be applied to all matching profiles. And we can see that it has g 4 run and Linux uh, specified uh, as the compiler and operating system which matches the second profile. Therefore, the minus W all will be appended to uh, the flags of the second profile. And there is also third one, which doesn't match the first one. Therefore, uh, it won't be appended. And these are the final flags uh, that will result. Uh, and this is uh, the example I wanted to uh, explain the hierarchy on. So we have a main package which has a profile specified with flags minus G and we have two dependencies, dependency one and dependency two. And the dependency one specifies its own flags so it uses them but dependency two does not. So it just asks a uh, main package which is its parent for the uh, profile and just inherits them and then dependency 2 has uh, two dependencies as well and uh, one of them dependency 2 1 uh, has its own profile so it just uses it and dependency 2 does not therefore uh, uh, it asks dependency 2 for a profile but dependency 2 does not have it 
so it recursively asks the main uh, and gets the profile from the main package. So uh, that is everything that I've prepared. Uh, I hope that it was on time. And uh, thank you all for your attention. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much, Jakob. Um, that's really great work that you've done there. Um, I can't stress enough how uh, complex a job that you've, you've been uh, tackling over the summer there. So uh, thank you very much for that. So unfortunately, um, we have run slightly over time and we uh, don't quite have uh, uh, time for the dedicated discussion session. Um, but I think um, we're all happy to continue answering questions in the Slack and I'll hold hand back over to the uh, conference organizers.